Hello, welcome back. We are now at lecture 37 and we'll be, we will talk about the Earth's atmosphere. We will talk about the thermodynamics of the atmosphere, uh, discuss the thermal profile in the atmosphere, and also uh, spend most of the time talking about heat exchanges uh, between the sun and the Earth as mediated by the atmosphere. I've made the decision to skip a number of formal proof and uh, theoretical background in, in this screencast to be a bit more descriptive. Uh, but uh, you should, for those who are interested in seeing the, 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 the formal development, they can uh, refer to the reference uh, book for this uh, series of screencasts, which is in the Blundell and Blundell. And if I have followed the same organization as the book. So let's let's get started. So first of all, let's think a little bit about the, the atmosphere's composition and size. Uh, as you know, the Earth is not just a big uh, spherical rock. Uh, it's the atmosphere is part of the Earth. So it's a, it has a very important uh, effect on, uh, on how the Earth works and how life is possible on Earth. So first of all, one thing that's important, and we'll discuss this a number of times during this screencast, is the chemical composition of the atmosphere. It's mostly nitrogen, about 80%, and uh, oxygen, uh, which of course we use uh, um, most, most living um, uh, cells need to, to, to consume oxygen. And there is also some other traces of, of gas, and uh, some of which are important, and we'll discuss, we'll discuss uh, that in, 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 the in, in a future slide. So the radius of the Earth is, uh, uh, 6,300 kilometers. Uh, notice that uh, typically the, the symbol for Earth is usually this one. So you will see the symbol for for the Sun in a second, but usually this cross with a with a, with a, with a disc around it is what we use for the Earth. Uh, we know that the pressure at sea level is about 10,000 pascal. And uh, of course, as you, we remember the definition of pressure, the pressure is that force of the that force that's, that's exerted on a one square meter of surface. Uh, so consider this, this, this big column of air. So that means that if we know the pressure, we know the force. And as we know, the force is, is gravitational in, in nature. Therefore, we should be able to calculate the, the mass of the atmosphere, right? Because it's possible to get uh, the mass of each column and uh, then we just have to multiply by the surface area of, of the sphere. So that's exactly what we do in the next equation. We can find the mass of the atmosphere simply by uh, taking the pressure, which is a force per, per unit area. So multiply by the unit area, which is the entire surface of the sphere. And if I divide by G, I can move from the force, from the gravitational force to the, to the mass. So G being uh, 931. And then find that the mass of the atmosphere is 5, 10 to the power uh, 18 uh, kilograms. Uh, and uh, of course, this is about one, one millionth of the mass of the Earth. So it's, it's small, but it's not, uh, uh, it is, it, it, it's far from zero. What's important is the atmosphere exchanging thermal heat with the ocean, which is a very large body. Uh, of, of, of water and, and with space uh, through radiation. So we are going to discuss this in this screencast. So the energy, most of the energy that, uh, that, we are, that, that hits the, the Earth comes from solar, from the sun. Uh, so the sun is, as, is described, as I mentioned a minute ago, by this symbol with small dots in a, in a, in a disk like this. So we talk about the luminosity, which is essentially the entire energy that's uh, that, that comes from the sun at any given second. The reason why the units are watts, joule per second. And uh, we can uh, actually calculate uh, the surface temperature. If you remember the Stefan Boltzmann law, uh, that the, 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 the energy is actually sigma t to the power four, sigma being the Stefan uh, constant. So the luminosity, and this gives the energy per, per square meter, essentially, the sigma t four. And if we multiply this by the surface area of the, of the sphere of the sun, we get the luminosity. And so if we use this, and, and let's say that we suppose that we know the solar radius 
to be this value, then we can calculate the temperature of the sun, which is 5,800 Kelvin. So this is, this is pretty hot, and this is going to be a number that's, that will come quite often in these screencasts. We will use this to describe the, the black body radiation of the sun. So we can also discuss uh, something else that's very important is the power that actually comes from the Earth, uh, to the Earth, sorry. Uh, of course, this, this uh, luminosity here is the total energy coming from the sun. Not all of it uh, hit the, the Earth. In fact, only a very tiny fraction, as you can see here, tiny, tiny fraction hits the, uh, hits the sun. And so uh, we've done this calculation in the previous, uh, in the previous lecture, actually. But uh, just to remind you, the, the actual power that incident on the Earth is the, the total uh, uh, power. It's just the fraction of the power that correspond to uh, the uh, 4 pi uh, RES square, which e RES is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So you have to consider that the if we suppose that the radiation from the Sun is uniform in, in three dimension, uh, if it's 100% when it's at the, so 100% of it is, 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 is always on the sphere uh, of, of constant radius going away from the sun, right? So, of course, when we had a distance RES, only that fraction of, of the, of the, 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 only that, that fraction of the luminosity hits the, the reaches the sun basically uh, at, that, at that particular place. So, we get this energy, and this is called the solar constant. Uh, we, we also know that, uh, the the, um, the 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 astronomical unit, which is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, is given by this distance, and this is what we used. We can use here, uh, and then uh, to get to get S, which is a solar constant. And finally, what an important thing that I've not introduced yet in this course is the albedo uh, number, which is basically saying what fraction of the energy that hits the the Sun the the Earth is actually absorbed. So some of it is reflected, and, that, and the portion of the, of the energy that's reflected is, is uh, related to, uh, to the albedo uh, term. So, uh, so only the, res the part that's not reflected, so 1 minus A, uh, is absorbed by the, by the Earth. And of course, uh, here, the, the, what we need to use is pi r square. We have to think a little bit the cross the cut of the, of the Earth uh, as give, uh, at any given time that actually sees the, the, the surface area of the Earth, the projected surface area of the Earth that actually sees the, uh, the sun at any given time. So these are just very, uh, very elementary uh, geometrical constructions. Uh, I, I invite you uh, to, to maybe pause this, this screencast and, and just make a drawing on a, on a piece of paper to convince yourself that this is, that this is all, all true, but this, this is all very, very much elementary. We also introduced this in a previous uh, uh, screencast when we spoke about the Wien's law and the Stefan Boltzmann uh, law and so on and so forth. So uh, what matters is that, the, of course, the Earth is also can also be treated as a black body, and it emits energy at a rate that uh, that is related to sigma t uh, t four, but time the surface area of the sphere. So that will give me the total energy, the, the, the the watt basically, if you will. Uh, that gives me the the, the, the total uh, uh, energy per second here, uh, coming from e, e being the radiative temperature of the Earth. Okay, so just to summar summarize, we get energy uh, from the sun, which is related to the to, to this constant S uh, multiplied by the surface area here of this cross cut pi r square of the Earth. Okay, we recognize the Earth here. And then, of course, the Earth gets energy, but it also uh, radiates thermal energy because it has a temperature. Remember the black body uh, radiation? It has a temperature Te. Therefore, it radiates thermal energy with these values. So what this is a total energy, the total energy per second. But we, we, as we have seen many times in this course, the spectral version of those numbers, so basically the energy Per, for a given wavelength, so given frequency, uh, turns out to be more important to understanding what's happening in the atmosphere, and that's what we are going to use in the rest of the screencast. 
But what before we go there, let's remember that uh, we we suppose that we are close to equilibrium, or at least at, equi or at equilibrium. So whatever comes to the is, is absorbed by the Earth over here on the left hand side. So remember, it's the albedo number is what we get uh, from outside, right? So uh, is what sorry what we get what hits the the Earth is what is actually transmitted as well. So this is we are at equilibrium. So that why do we do this? Because that will allow us to get to find the temperature of the Earth, and uh, uh, this is this is simple manipulation. And we find the temperature of the Earth is about 255 K. While you may wonder, this is significantly smaller than the temperature, um, the temperature that we know, that we, the, 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 the average temperature on the Earth. But this is, this is important to remember, this is the effective temperature. And also, uh, it's actually the temperature of the Earth and the atmosphere. So we have to consider the system, Earth atmosphere as being one system that, um, that exchange energy and, and, and basically manage the energy that's coming from the sun and say, emit it back outside. So that means that uh, this temperature is actually an average temperature. And, and, and as we're going to see in the next few minutes, uh, the temperature of the atmosphere is actually much lower. So this average temperature makes sense. That it's, it's lower than the temperature that we know at the surface of the, of the Earth. So this is what we will do for the next few minutes. I'd like to talk about the, the temperature profile in, in the atmosphere. I, I'd like to also say that uh, I like this picture because it presents the different different areas of, uh, of the atmosphere. Just be careful that this is not at scale. Uh, the radius of the, of the Earth is about 6,000 kilometers. And so you see uh, here we have just 20 kilometers and here we have 10,000. So clearly we, have, we don't have a linear scale. Um, so there is a we go from troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, and then we have those area in between tropopause, stratopause, mesopause, and exopause, exo, exo base, uh, which is right here. Good. Let's try to to think a little bit about what's happening. And for this, we are going to consider the lowest region, and imagine that we have a fixed mass of dry air. So imagine imagine just a, a volume, maybe one one cubic meter of, of dry air. We say dry air, that way it's, it makes things a little bit simpler. We don't have to worry about phase transition of water and things like that for now. So we suppose there is no exchange of heat with the surroundings. So in other words, it's an adiabatic process. Uh, and so in, in this case, because uh, we, we, can, uh, we can use the enthalpy, uh, the enthalpy is going to be the change of heat, so of course uh, an irreversible process plus VDP. It's pretty typical. And as we know, we have defined the the heat capacity at constant pressure as as being um, dH over dt, basically. So this is nothing new, something from the from the early uh, from from the early lectures of this course. Uh, of course, since the, it's adiabatic, there is no exchange of heat. And CPDT is equal to VDP. That's pretty straightforward. And that allows me to give, to, 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 that's going to allow me to, to, to study this in particular. Now, we can also, um, what we are interested in here is to understanding the temperature profile with a distance, not with pressure. So we have to find a relationship between pressure and distance. And of course, we know that the relationship is called the hydrostatic equation. The hydrostatic equation relate the pressure with the distance. And again, this is not nothing else than Newton's law. Uh, Newton's law using the, the uh, basically this is this is the mass. Uh, we have we have a, a mass term and then a G, which is the, the gravitational constant. So we, we see that the pressure actually changes with distance simply related to this to this idea of, of, uh, of gravitational pull that is. So what's nice about this is that, of course, it gives me an expression of how the pressure changes uh, with respect to the distance. And that will allow me to, to introduce this in here. So we, I will have a temperature and distance relationship, which is what I want. So uh, what I end up doing, I end up getting an expression of dt over dz, and which is equal to minus rho g v over cp. So this is just by substitution. And of course, very often we say we, we have the specific heat, which is the heat capacity per volume, uh, per, per mass. So that allows me to simplify a little bit this. 
And finally, we have this constant. I mean, CP is a constant for the particular situation here. Uh, G, of course, is a constant. And we get that the change in temperature with respect to to uh, to distance is going to be the lapse, uh, the adiabatic uh, lapse rate. It's actually minus because we know the temperature goes down uh, as a function of uh, as we increase the distance from the from the Earth. So this is a negative number, and in order to uh, the adiabatic lapse rate to be a positive number, we put a negative there. This is this is fairly standard. Uh, so there, however, the, the reality is that there is some heat transfer. So it's not just uh, it's not completely adiabatic, uh, so th that's that's very important. It turns out. So, so imagine what we've done so far. We've used a dry, we've used a, a mass of dry air, and we see that uh, it can. It, we, we looked at uh, we look at how the temperature changes. Uh, how the temperature changes with with the distance from the Earth, and we see that it it changes this way with the adiabatic lapse rate. Now it turns out that uh, there is con a considerable heat transfer uh, at the bottom of the atmosphere, so the troposphere. When we say bottom, we talk about the place where the, where the planes uh, fly, so the first 10,000 kilometers, the first 10 kilometers, sorry, the first 10 kilometers. 10,000 would be the shuttle, the space shuttle, things like that. So, uh, of course, the air is warm, in particular with contact with the Earth's surface, uh, and then that, that heating is actually uh, uh, lead the air to uh, so, so we, we end up having uh, hotter air, and this is this means that we have a larger gradient uh, due to this heating. And if we go back to the previous uh, equations that we had on the previous slide, that means that we we no longer have this uh, equilibrium between the hydrostatic pressure and and the fact that we have a, a, a the, the, the 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 movement of the air. Uh, uh, the, the change in temperature in the air. So that means that this this uh, we are in out of equilibrium, and this is how this is why the the dry air is actually start to rise. So we have the the air warms and then rises, and then what happens is that by by rising it ends up at places where the temperature is lower. So basically, it's losing is losing uh, uh, temperature. So we end up in a different situation. So in that case, instead of being equilibrium. Uh, the hydrostatic pool is actually larger, so that the air co com comes back down, and so that's exactly what's happening uh, here. And this is called this is called the convection current. In fact, this is what uh, explains how the the air is actually uh, move across the first uh, portion of the atmosphere, so in the troposphere. So we have this uh, this convection current. This can be easy easily explained by this by this. Uh, uh, tug of war, if you will, between uh, warmer air that rises and then the gravitation of uh, a pool like this. So this is all good. Uh, in fact, this is this can happen vertically as well. So this is an horizontal effect. Can also happen vertically. This change in 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 temperature. So those gradients of temperature, and then um, and also because of changes in in, in pressure. And, and this is also done in addition to Coriolis effect. Remember, Coriolis effect is is related to the fact that the Earth is rotating, and you. And this is what justifies the existence of cyclones and anticyclones. Uh, they can trans transport uh, energy from the equator to the pole, and, and this is very much related to the Coriolis effect. So a cyclone is going to rotate one direction, and a an anticyclone to the other direction. So anyway, so this is this is all related to to how the heat and energy is being exchanged through the atmosphere. So we have other. So this is happening in the troposphere, the first ten thousand kilometers, ten first ten kilometers. So we have other areas. We have the tropopause between the stratosphere and the troposphere. There is not not much happening. There's there's no convection. Um, then we have the stratosphere, and the stratosphere temperature is pretty much constant in the first part. Uh, stratosphere is is uh, stratified, uh, so there's lots of stratified regions. It's the reason why it's called a stratosphere, and this is it is called optically thin, and this is a very important concept: the op optical thickness or thinness, and this is something I'm going to discuss in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, optically thin, for now, it suffices to to know that optically thin means that it doesn't absorb uh, much of the radiation. So, in other words, uh, the the stratosphere does not does not uh, absorb much. In fact, the absorptivity of that part is about 
uh, about uh, so zero point one, yes, about ten percent, uh, and that means that the absorption of the uh, of the, for example, in the far infrared region, and again we are going to talk why we talk about infrared region for the Earth in a minute, um, is about this this value here. So um, and again using the Stefan Boltzmann's law. So. Uh, the stratosphere emits uh, the bottom area uh, of the stratosphere emits at a rate uh, uh, given by epsilon sigma t to the power four at the temperature of the stratosphere, and it also emits at the upper surface. So this, the total emission is given is given by this, and so that means that we can calculate the temperature of the stratosphere as a function of temperature of of the of the earth effective temperature of the earth as we discussed two fifty five. And we find the temperature of stratosphere is 214, which is which is about the numbers that we, we give here. So this is a way to calculate this. Uh, again, you need input from outside, and the input from outside to understand what's happening is the fact that it's optically thin and the absorptivity is about 0 0.1. Okay, very nice. So if we go up the, str the altitude of the, str of the tra stratosphere, uh, the temperature actually starts to rise after that, after, after the first layers that we just discussed. And uh, in fact, there is quite a bit of absorption of energy uh, by the by the ozone, so by O3, the molecule O3, and the molecule O3 absorbs uh, uh, UV, ultraviolet light, and this ultraviolet light is the one coming from the sun. And again, we're going to discuss that in a second. And I will really try to insist on the concept and what's important about understanding where the energy is coming from. So the temperature goes up, actually. In this area, uh, 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 in, the, in this in this part of the stratosphere, uh, to reach uh, minus two point five degrees centigrade, uh, so around two 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 seventy something like this. Then after that, uh, you end up in this area between stratosphere and mesosphere, which is the stratopause. You end up in the mesosphere. Uh, there is not much happening there, and uh, in fact, not much in terms of of. Uh, uh, of uh, absorbing energy, so the temperature start to to to, dec to decay very quickly, and then finally the thermosphere is uh, the temperature uh, shoots up very quickly. This is where all the ionization effect and very high energy uh, photon takes place, and in fact this is also uh, the ionization effect. Uh, for example, uh, C can be seen as the aurora. And so all those, this is a lot of energy uh, involved in those. Uh, and so that correspond to a very high increase in temperature. So you see the, the, the atmosphere is a, is a very, uh, is, is, a, is something that's, that's actually pretty complex. Many layers and different aspects are going on. So you, you see that uh, there's quite a bit happening in troposphere. Uh, in terms of of the of the movement of of the co convection, so and, and and you know lots of about the weather, that's happening a lot about absorption, uh, ultraviolet being also taken by uh, being absorbed by in the mesosphere, and then finally the higher the higher energetics uh, uh, the hi the higher energy particles uh, never reach the Earth because they they actually uh, interact in the thermosphere. So all those things are, are very important and uh, uh, makes Earth actually a place, a place that we can live in. But we are going to discuss this a bit more and, and, and discuss especially the, the absorption of uh, energy uh, in, the different, in, in a particular case in a second. So before we go there, I'd like to spend a minute about uh, an important concept, which is radiance versus irradiance. And we've discussed that already quite a bit, but we this is I want to make sure it's clear. The radiance is basically a, a property of an object that emits energy, and it's uh, the, the it, it's it's well understood. It's best to understand the radiance as a as the energy emitted by a source, um, which is which is a power, of course, it's energy per second, and it's uh, it, it's actually it, it's actually for a particular direction. So this is example here of the light bulb. So this would be the, the radiance will be the energy per, uh, for given direction, so per solid angle and per surface area. So this is very important to realize. So it's not the entire energy that's, that's emitted, it's just for a given direction. Now, 
this is radiance is basically the property of the of the source i would say irradiance is something different the irradiance is related of course to radiance but the irradiance is the energy that's that's coming to a certain point okay so not only it com can come from any direction but it also uh, depends on 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 the path that was taken by for example, the light, as, he, as, he le as the light left the source to a given point. So that's going to be called the irradiance. So really what matters to us with the irradiance is the amount of energy per surface area. There is no longer the idea of having a, uh, a solid angle in this case, because we are interested in the energy coming from all possible angles. It's going to be called the irradiance. So let's try, now that we have this definition in mind, let's, let's try to understand uh, how we understand this. And, and you will see, uh, I will repeat this definition probably a couple of times just to make sure. So let's try to, to consider uh, radiative transfer. Uh, and the question is, how is the energy exchange between the different parts of the atmosphere? And this is, this is what we want to understand. So we are going to suppose that the energy uh, uh, goes through an absorbing me medium. So you have to consider the photons that are coming, for example, from the sun. And they are going through the atmosphere. So what can happen to them? Well, they go through the absorbing medium, uh, and the absorption can be due to, to ions, can be due to, to, uh, to, uh, to molecules, to all sorts of things, clouds, so whatever. So there is something that can absorb the energy. And we are going to suppose that uh, it's, going to go, it's going through a distance d, dz. And uh, if we have a density, a linear density rho a, then the total mass um, uh, or if we want to or rho a to be a density, then rho a dz would be a, 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 a mass per unit area, right? Uh, so we get this mass per unit area is going to absorb some, absorb uh, some of the light, and we suppose it's a density of matter, so it's probably molecules. So we are going to introduce uh, the concept of extinction coefficient, which is uh, noted by uh, the notation kappa nu, and the fraction of photons of frequency nu that are absorbed or scattered for unit mass of absorber. So it's an empirical properties, and it's going to depend on the, the, the frequency of the photons that we are looking at. So that means that the radiance power, so, the, so that's, again, as I said, the radiance is the per unit area and per solid angle. Uh, we are going to introduce that. It's going to be I of nu. Right, so for given frequency, so the spa that, that spatial radiance passing through uh, a distance dz will therefore change like this. Right, let's try to think. The change in radiance is going to be related to 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 the um, to the to the amount of the, for the, to the reduction of it. So the reduction of it, the portion that's reduced is kappa nu times the mass, so rho a dz times i. Right, it's the uh, the portion of I nu that absorbed minus because it's a decrease if it's absorbed. We can of course integrate this function, and if we suppose that kappa and rho are not z dependent, right, we end up with the the this, the radians changing this way as a function of distance. Okay, so this is this would be true for uniform medium. Uniform medium comes from the fact that rho does not depend on z and kappa does not depend on z. This is called the, the Beer-Lambert law and it's going to simply give you how the intensity decreases exponentially. Now if we have a non-uniform medium, which is the case most of the time, we can still write an equation like this. In fact, we can integrate the equation from the previous slide, uh, but now the, the difference is that we still have an exponential, but the exponential now has to be integrated to take into account the fact that the density of matter is not a constant with distance z. And in fact, we are going to call this the optical path length. So the optical path length is provided by, by uh, a weighted average, if you will, of the, of the mass density times uh, the uh, extension coefficient. That's very important result because the optical path length that we've introduced here uh, clearly dictate how fast the intensity of the light, the intensity of photons at a given frequency nu decays. In fact, when, when that number is very large, 
and this could be very large, for example, if we have very dense system or very uh, kappa nu uh, as a high extinction, extinction uh, coefficient, then we have an optically thick uh, layer simply because uh, this intensity is going to decay extremely quickly and, and the, the radiation do not, does not penetrate much. So it's an optically thick uh, system. We can also have an optically thin uh, system, which would be for, uh, for this optical path is very much smaller than one. In this case, the exponential is almost uh, this exponential of zero. So the exponential is essentially one. That means that the intensity, the irradiance does not change much at all. So sometimes uh, because of, of this interpretation, uh, this optical path things can also be called the optical depth. Uh, we are going to, to, to put it at zero at the top of the atmosphere. Uh, that's the light that comes into the atmosphere in this case. And uh, the entire light basically, we basically put the origin of, of the z-axis at the outside of the atmosphere. So we have the entire intensity. And then it goes down as we penetrate into the atmosphere. So this is, this is how we, we integrate in this case. So, of course, uh, this, the problem is a bit more complicated than this because uh, we, we have an absorption, of course, of the frequency nu, but the the, the, that radiation is also re-emitted, right? So, so the equation that I had before has to be, has to be corrected for, an, uh, for source function. So, of course, we, have, we do have a decay, but we also have, uh, we also have uh, uh, an emission. So an increase, so that we don't only have a decay, but we also have an increase. By the way, this is a good idea to remember Kirchhoff's law about good absorbers and good emitters, that we find both uh, kappa nu here and here. So if we have good absorption, you also have good emission. That's, that's an interesting thing to remember. Uh, so uh, we, can, we can actually uh, uh, look uh, into this here. And J nu would be the black body uh, radiance uh, if, this, if we are in thermal equilibrium. The point remains is that we end up with an extremely important equation, which is called the radiative transfer or Schwarzschild uh, equation, which can be written uh, this way uh, um, by the definition of the optical depth that we have here. So I am not going to go much into the details about how to solve this equation. Uh, a couple of examples are provided in the reference book. Uh, instead, I'm, I want to I want to make sure that you understand where every term is coming from, and so I think that we have achieved that in this slide. Uh, so one thing that the first thing that we have to realize now is that everything we've done so far was for radiance, and what of course what I'm interested in is irradiance. One first problem with irradiance is that uh, for an isotropic medium, for example, we need to to integrate all directions. Remember the irradiance is per uh, surface area and doesn't matter how the light comes in, in terms of, uh, of angle, while the radiance is per solid angle. So basically it gives you a certain direction. So you do have to do this integral. And uh, for an isotropic medium, uh, this is pretty straightforward, but for an isotropic medium, you, you will see that uh, it turns out that uh, the relationship between the irradiance uh, F and the radiance I is actually simply a factor of pi. So it just comes from the integration over the half uh, hemisphere that we have here. You can see it's half because we only have pi over two here. But the point remains, let's not try to, let's, let's not uh, uh, get confused by, by this kind of details, which is, which is again, very elementary uh, to show. But the point remains that you can find in the isotropic medium like this, uh, you could you can find the irradiance as a function of the, the irradiance uh, simply by by with a factor of pi. Now it turns out that if you do a more realistic treatment, and again uh, I invite you if you're interested to know how to get this equation, I invite you to look into the the reference book that we that we've been using for this for this course for this course. If you if you do that, you will see that uh, it turns out that the irradiance can be calculated in a in a more advanced way. And remember, chi is the optical depth that we put to zero at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, non-zero on the Earth's surface. And chi s is the optical depth at the surface of the Earth, right? So I just want to be clear. So we are busy, think about chi going from zero to the top of the atmosphere, and we enter the atmosphere to, towards the Earth, right? So uh, let's try to understand a little bit this equation. The irradiance at a given place 
right? Because it's that's usually what's going to, to be saying here as a function of depth. It's going to be the one uh, coming from the Earth right here. So this is a radiance from the from the, uh, it's a, it's related to the radiance coming from the Earth minus an absorption term. Okay, so this is going to be something that's going to absorb. Uh, uh, some of the light uh, that, that, that's, that was initially uh, radiated. So, if we are at the Earth, uh, if we are, just to understand a bit better, if we are at the Earth's surface, chi here is equal to chi s. So clearly, at the Earth's atmosphere, uh, we have f chi s is equal to pi beta chi s, which basically means that we have no absorption or anything. Of course, this is directly looking at the amount of radiation from the Earth that still survives at the surface of the Earth. Of course, all of it survives. So this is the reason why we do not have uh, uh, here the damping factor, if you will. Now, if you're at top of the atmosphere, it's a little bit different uh, because then you have all the absorbing uh, effect that come into the game. This can be a very complicated function to calculate because chi can be a complicated thing to calculate, but this is doable. And uh, one thing that, another thing that's important is that sometimes we talk about transparent media, uh, medium. A transparent medium is one where there is no absorption whatsoever. And in that case, this term is actually going to be equal to zero as well. And this would be equal to the, also when we have isothermal atmosphere, because the temperature dependence on Temperature dependence in this problem is actually included in in the in in chi and and, and actually the, this profile as well. The profile of chi. So this is all nice. Uh, this is an important equation in the sense that it tells you that uh, the irradiance at the given point is going to be related to the source term minus some absorption term obtained here. Okay. So what could be absorbing? Well, what could be absorbing, for example, are the molecules that are in the atmosphere. And as we are going to discuss in a second, uh, in a second, the optical thickness uh, can be described by by the presence of molecule. But we will see that some molecules do not contribute. For uh, nitrogen and oxygen do not contribute to the optical thickness in the infrared region, as opposed to carbon dioxide and water. They do. Uh, this is something I'm going to repeat at least a couple of times. So let's let's move on from here. So this slide is is very. Uh, uh, load it, but don't worry, I'm going to really dissect every single line here in this given slide. But that's just so that it's very clear, the different processes. It's not complicated, but it's it's kind of, a, uh, it are many steps. So let's try to, to have an overview and then I will describe everything in detail. First of all, the Earth received most energy from the sun. It, it happens in the form of short wavelength radiation. And we are going to describe this in a second, mostly in the visible and UV range. And this is due to the fact that the sun has a surface temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin. And this, this particular, uh, this is a black body radiation of 5,800 Kelvin correspond to those wavelengths. Now the earth gets heated, so it gets a certain temperature. And the, the, the radiation from the earth is mostly in the long wavelength radiation, mostly infrared. And this is because, uh, uh, er, the earth temperature is about a factor 20 lower than that of the sun. Uh, remember Wien's law, right? Temperature increases, the maximum wavelength of, of emission uh, decreases uh, proportionally, I mean, inversely proportionally. So some of the, of the incoming radiation is reflected by the atmosphere directly, and the rest is weakly absorbed by the atmosphere. So we are still talking about the incoming radiation. So then there is absorption uh, from uh, the land and the ocean, and some of it is reflected, and this is the albedo effect that we discussed before. Now, uh, let's try to think that the Earth's surface uh, emits radiation, and that radiation that's emitted by the Earth is then absorbed by the atmosphere, and then re-radiated. Re this is what we, I discussed in the previous slide, uh, describing uh, the effect of optical thickness and so on and so forth. So the problem is that the re-radiation occurs in all directions and can therefore uh, lead to a reabsorption of heat by the Earth. And this is what creates an increase in temperature because there's more heat coming in. So the question is how much ray radiation and what happens? What are the actual processes that lead to this effect? So let's try to do this uh, step by step. Basically, what I'm going to do in the next five, 10 minutes is take each of these points one after another 
uh, just to describe them. So if you if it's a little bit too much information on one side, do not worry. I'm going to 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 dissect this. The first thing you have to realize is this. So I reproduce this this uh, this figure here on the right just to make sure it's clear. Uh, this is not always well um, realized by students that. Yes, the black body radiation, which is shown here for the radiance on the on the left hand side so related to the energy density uh, it's fine it's it's this this is well we understand that the sun and the earth behave very much like a black body uh we'll discuss this when we discuss about the black body radiation, but we also know that those curves that are represented by this equation depend a lot by the temperature. We know that the sun is about 5,800 Kelvin, the earth is about 300 Kelvin. And so the two body, the, the thing that students don't always see is the two plots on the same graph. And so here I've done this, I've put the, the, the radiance for the sun and the earth, and these are the two graphs. So you have to realize that there is an, about an, a, a factor 20, 25, or 20 or 25 between the, the, the distribution due to the sun and due to the earth by the way i normalize the radiance here so so it's clear so do not do not uh, i did normalize to one for the maximum to be to one so that's very important because the physics and the chemistry that happens at those energies is very much different from the physics and, and chemistry that happens in those energies in fact these energies here in the infrared region right which is basically the frequency the typical frequency of the vibrations of small molecules while here it's an ultraviolet region, which is where you can start to have some electron transfer and that kind of thing. So much higher energy than you would have to excite the vibration. And this is, we are going to see, this is very key to understanding the different, uh, the, the effect of different area of the atmosphere on energy absorption and re-emission. So just like you to keep in mind this, this plot, the fact that we have uh, a, a vastly different distribution of of energies uh, at, at, at what frequency or wavelength the, the, uh, the, the emission happens for a hot body versus an, uh, uh, a cold body like Earth, a colder body like Earth. So let's try to do this. First of all, there is sunlight coming from the, from the sun and it's hitting uh, the Earth and I actually put the atmosphere. The Earth is much thinner than the atmosphere, uh, also because it's mostly surface effect, but also remember that the atmosphere is actually like ten, it's actually ten thousand kilometers. The Earth is about six thousand kilometers um, uh, radius. So the, the so the scales here are not correct, other than the fact that what I wanted to show on this is that the Earth, just the thin layer of the Earth, is 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 uh, involved in, in in the energy exchange with the with the Sun, at least in this in this approximation. So what we know about this so far, well, we know, we know that already the distribution of energy of the radiance coming from the sun is just what I showed you in the previous slide, just for the sun with this distribution. So we know this very well coming from the sun, very close to, to the black body radiation. Okay. Now what happens, the first thing that happens is that we have reflection by the atmosphere. So mo a lot of, a big portion of the energy coming from the, from the sun is actually reflected by the atmosphere. So that's one one thing that happens. So this is not this is not an energy we have to worry about because it's actually reflected. We'd never see it again, and it's fine. Now, some of it, some of the energy actually goes into the atmosphere, and in the upper level of the atmosphere, where there is the ozone, so O3, we have absorption of some of the ultraviolet, and. If you remember, uh, uh, there was the ozone layer that was a, a hole in the ozone layer, which turns out to have uh, uh, disappeared, actually, this, the hole. That was a big concern because uh, the ozone layer is extremely important to absorbing the ultraviolet coming from the sun. So those UV, which are those that, that cause cancer, basically uh, skin cancer, for example, uh, have been... Uh, are being stopped in a large, a large portion of them, a large fraction of them is, um, is, uh, uh, is stopped by the presence of ozone in the upper layer of the atmosphere. And so that's an important thing that, ha that happens. Uh, so oxygen absorbs uh, some of the UV and, and the, the mechanism of the physical mechanism of absorption and UV is, is not a vibration, it's actually an excitation that we have. So that's good, and uh, this is a proof here. It's a, it's a plot I found from this from this uh, uh, resource here. Um, it's a little bit of a busy plot, but I think it's an important one. 
let's say, let's let's try to look at the extraterrestrial uh, extraterrestrial uh, uh, profile. It's essentially a, a profile looked outside of the atmosphere, and you see that this profile, so it's an experimental profile, almost fit, fits very well the black body radiation for the sun. Of course, there are some some differences, uh, but that's not much. So the black, it looks like the sun is indeed. Uh, um, is indeed radiating like a black body at 5,800 Kelvin. Now, what's interesting is that if you do the same as the, at the Earth's surface coming from the sun, you see that there is a large damping here in this visible and UV range. And this damping is due to the presence of, of the ozone. So what's actually hitting the Earth is this, uh, th th this plot here. And there is a lot of things happening here, which I'm going to discuss in this infrared region in a, in a few minutes ago. But what matters here is that this big chunk and the UV, which would be harmful for skin, for example, uh, and, and uh, mutation and things like that, uh, is actually being uh, absorbed. A large portion of it is, is being absorbed by, by the ozone. So this is what we mean by, by some of the energy coming from the sun is absorbed by, by the atmosphere. OK, now imagine now that the the this particular ray here came into it just and didn't get absorbed end up on the earth okay so end up reaching the earth the, the surface of the earth a lot of it is going to be reflected for example by the glacier by the by snow or by by the surface of the ocean or, or what have you so this is this is the albedo coefficient that we discussed at the beginning of this lecture some of it will be absorbed and then will will uh, contribute to the temperature of the Earth. So the Earth is going to have a certain temperature, and then the Earth is going to behave like a black body radi radiator and will uh, radiate at a temp at, with a black body radiation corresponding to 300 Kelvin or so. So this is this plot that we have here, which is shifted to the right to the, uh, compared to the sun, as we have discussed already a number of times. So basically, think about what's happening. The total energy, of course, is, is conserved in all these processes, but we have now that the Earth is, is reflecting it. So, so far, so good. Now, here is what's happening. What's happening is that if you look at the wavelength, the wavelengths are about a mic, uh, so a micrometer will be here. Uh, so here we have uh, a millimeter will be here. So this is about 15 millimeter wavelength. So centimeter the wavelengths and these uh, these distances are correspond to the infrared region, and so here is the issue: is the issue is that that particular uh, those particular frequencies of the spectral uh, radiance, those particular frequencies are pretty much in resonance with the vibrational frequencies of trace of gases that exist in the atmosphere. So this is what's happening we actually have an absorption inside the atmosphere of some of this black body radiation from the Earth in this area. And this is what I'm going to spend quite a bit of time in the rest of this lecture about. So we have that, and what's happening is this. If you look at a, a plot of the irradiance now, so the, it's the radiance plus the, the fact that we have an optical thick layer, so they absorb some, and we see that this is actually this this corresponds to, to about 300 Kelvin. You see, this is the this is for, on the Earth, so you can tell from the Earth. And then you see that uh, what's happening here is that um, most of the most of the of the, the, the there is a big change here, big absorption in this area, and this big absorption is actually due to carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide can actually absorb um, a, a large portion of the infrared region, so exactly where there is a peak, actually, uh, in the atmosphere. And this energy that is absorbed by carbon dioxide comes from the Earth. It does not come from the sun directly, of course. It comes, of course, it comes from the sun indirectly. But this is he that's, that's actually, this is, these are photons that come from, from the Earth. And so this is this big reduction. So the question is, Good. No, I mean, it, good in the sense that the energy coming from the Earth is absorbed by the carbon dioxide. So where does that energy go? Well, before we know where it goes, let's try to think 
it's actually the energy is actually absorbed by carbon dioxide and, and water, it turns out, because these are molecules that have a net dipole moment, electrical dipole moment, and therefore can be excited by the electromagnetic nature of, infra, of, 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 the, of light. So there is a coupling between the electric and magnetic field of, of light and the dipole, electrical dipole moment of those molecules. There is no molecule, uh, dipole, there is no electrical dipole, electric dipole moment in, for example, uh, nitrogen or oxygen. There's a reason why they do not contribute to absorbing any of this, of this, uh, of those photons. But this little portion of carbon dioxide, which is a tiny, tiny fraction, right? Tiny fraction of the composition of the atmosphere is sufficient to absorb so much energy as I showed in the previous slide. So this is what's happening. Okay. Now, it turns out that these particular uh, molecules, so carbon dioxide and oxygen, uh, are infrared active and absorb in this region, in those in those region here, and justify uh, why we have uh, lots of absorption of the energy coming from the Earth by the atmosphere. Now here is where the problem comes. The problem comes from the fact that that energy that absorbed in the atmosphere is re-radiated. But the thing is, it's re-radiated in all directions. J yes, sure enough, to the outside, towards the towards the, the, the space, but also back towards Earth, and therefore contributes to increasing uh, the energy that hits the Earth. So, in other words, increases the temperature. And so, this is a great thing. When we have very small amount of carbon dioxide, this is wonderful. It's called as, as it's discussed in, in, in the textbook that we use, it's called the, the winter coat. Basically provides a way to uh, radiating energy in the infrared region, which is, which is basically how we, we, we heat up. It's it provides that energy back to, to, uh, to the Earth to provide this, this, this temperature, the temperature that we can live in, as, as opposed to other planets in, in the solar system that do not have a, an atmosphere, and therefore, when temperature varies a lot, or it's usually pretty cold when there is no, no sun directly hitting it. But the problem is, if there's too much of it, if there's too much of this radiation, temperature increases and can increase significantly. And those increase can have a profound effect in the, in the biological uh, equilibrium that we, that, that we have reached on, on Earth. So let's try to 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 just uh, discuss this a, a bit more. And this this is basically a summary of what I just said. The those uh, those molecules are called bonnets. I call greenhouse gas for obvious reason. I hope now uh, this is basically uh, those molecules that uh, that absorb energy and then re uh, emit the energy, re radiate the energy. So in other words, they they behave a bit like a greenhouse. Okay. And so this is this is what's happening, and very tiny amount of carbon monoxide is sufficient to to have that effect. I should also say that water does also have an effect like this. So the of course vapor, water vapor, also have a, a greenhouse effect on, on on Earth, and it's actually part of the feedback mechanism I want to talk to you about. So this idea of a winter coat is very nice uh, for when the number of carbon monoxide is small. Uh, because it keeps the energy nice, but if there's too much winter coat, I mean, if there's a winter coat and it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit outside, uh, that might not be the right time to have it. Well, it looks like that's where we are getting at now. Uh, the level of carbon monoxide in the atmosphere right now is is basically high enough to 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 look at the situation as if we were starting to wear a winter coat in the middle of the summer. So this is this is an issue, and and let's try to 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 discuss this a little bit more detail. This is related, uh, this is related to, to global warming. So the global warming is, is a fact. Uh, it's just an experimental fact. OK, we, we are not here. Uh, very often, uh, we, we, want to do, we want to do science. Then there is politics, and there is opinions. This is not about opinions. This is not about politics. It's about looking at the numbers. Okay, we are scientists, and as scientists, we have that responsibility. And there's numbers, and I just got these numbers from uh, as recent as possible. These are as, as current as possible at the time I'm uh, recording this screencast. Is a, is a look at the temperature anomalies 
for example, uh, in July, uh, as provided by NOAA. So you see this from the about 140 years, uh, a span over 140 years, and you see the temperature have significantly increased uh, with an increase that seems to keep going up uh, ever since about 1940. I mean, there were some fluctuations here, of course, this is a complex system, so there is no, you know, it's not, it's normal to have lots of fluctuations, but it looks like every year is a new record, okay? And so, uh, it turns out that it would appear from analysis of data that this temperature change seems to be due to, so, so global warming exists. There is no question about this. It's clear on this picture. But it, it would appear that the, the increase in temperature should be, is likely due to um, human activities. And this is what's called anthropogenic climate change. So anthropogenic means that it's brought about by, by, by humans. And um, one, one explanation for this is related to what happens in this area here in the, in the late 19th century, early 20th century with the uh, industrial, industrial revolution. And so one, one problem that the, uh, uh, some people in the general population have uh, to a hard time to understand this is the delay. Okay, if the if the revolution if the initial revolution was here and the global warming is only seen since the 80s, let's say, well, how do you explain that? Well, by now with this course, you should know there is a lot of latency happening. There is a delay between uh, between a cause and an effect. It's not instantaneous, and also related to the fact that uh, uh, there is a heat capacity effect, of course. Uh, so to some point, to some level, we can. Taking into account the increased amount of energy that's uh, that's provided, uh, for example, to a body of, of material, body of water, for instance, for the ocean, while keeping the temperature at bay, but there is a point where these things can no longer, this buffering effect can no longer uh, work as efficiently, and that's that's what's happening. So this delay is a big is a big issue in people's mind, and so uh, so it would appear that the the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere seems to be responsible for this increase in temperature. It can be explained by uh, the processes that I explained in, in, in this course, which is related to the infrared absorption from, uh, uh, from, phonons, uh, from photons coming directly from, from the Earth due to the black body radiation of the Earth. So worse than that is a feed, there are some feedback mechanism. So, so the, the, the thing is that people are trying to explain, uh, to understand this. It's very complicated because it's a nonlinear effect. There's a lot of, lot of boundary conditions that we don't necessarily know. There are fluctuations, as we know. Uh, but there is one thing that makes it even more difficult and makes it nonlinear is that we have two types of feedbacks. So we have positive and negative feedback. So the positive feedbacks are the one that contributes to increasing the, the effect. So people would say it's, a neg it's positive feedback as an adverse effect. So as the atmosphere heats up, it can actually hold more water vapor. So vapor, water vapor uh, liquefy later, therefore, because the temperature is higher, therefore that water can contribute more to the global warming. So that's, that's an issue. Another issue is that as temperature increases, there is less ice, and so there is less albedo effect, so less reflection, and therefore increased temperature as well. So that's another issue. These are two exa examples of, of feed positive feedback mechanism. On the other case, there is a negative feedback mechanism. That, so negative feedback in this case has to be understood as an effect that reduces the cause. Right? Uh, so you can say that it's beneficial if you do not like global warming. Uh, a higher temperature, uh, uh, higher temperature can promote a growth rate of plants and trees, which can there, therefore can themselves uh, increase the intake of carbon dioxide and therefore reduce the effect. So this is this is something that's good. It's good to do so long as we do not uh, remove all the forests and all the plants from, from the earth. So what people have been trying to, to predict what's happening with global warming. The issue with global warming is that you have to, first of all, it's, 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 there is a latency effect, as I explained before. There's a, dis, there's a time difference between, between uh, the cause and the effect. The other thing is that there is an unknown in the source. So the increase in carbon monoxide is mostly related to uh, the increase of, of, uh, of lifestyle. 
people who have a, a society that have a high lifestyle consume a lot, produce a lot of carbon dioxide. And uh, as number of region of the on the planet are increasing in population and the lifestyle increases, um, it's likely that the, the amount of carbon dioxide that's going to be released in the atmosphere is going to go up rather than down. So unless we've come up with other sources of energy production, like other than fossil fuels that uh, release a lot of carbon dioxide, we will keep releasing a lot of carbon uh, uh, dioxide in the atmosphere and therefore contribute to global warming. And again, if the feed positive feedback mechanism are stronger than the negative one, this is a runaway train and the temperature is going to keep increasing um, until uh, the, the changes to the, to, the, to the planet as we know it uh, are irreversible. This is something to think about. So this is going to be what, probably one of my last slides before the, the summary slide. And, and people are trying to model these things. And, and this is when you look at models for difficult situations like global warming or for uh, the, uh, how the stock market is going to behave, it's always a good idea to look at many different models. And so usually the models go from one extreme to the next. So with very conservative um, uh, uh, constraints or, or, or conditions to very uh, uh, much much more loose conditions. So, for example, going from all the way from stopping altogether all production of carbon monoxide or an extremely large increase, even much larger than we would think. So, we come up with a number of uh, of models that are not labeled here, but the point remains that these are different models that that are related to the change in temperature. And so. Uh, those those models uh, go from, as I said, very very optimistic to very pessimistic. But let's even forget the most pessimistic that uh, that think about an increase of six degrees centigrade or six Kelvin. Same thing. If we look at the bur the bulk of of models, they they go from plus five to by plus two, and I'm talking about twenty one hundred. Okay, so you have to realize this is this is just around the corner. Okay, this is just around the corner. We're talking about in 80 years. Even the most the most optimistic model predict about 1.5 degrees increase in temperature, and 1.5 degree increase is, is substantial in terms of the amount of of uh, of uh, uh, effect that it will have the number of effect it will have on on how the Earth is working. So it's very important in order to to understand to understanding what's going on. We have to rely on science. We, this is not a matter of opinion here. It's a matter of science and matter of understanding and a matter of educating. So I hope for those who have li been listening to this screencast uh, and in this this one in particular, you've been uh, educated enough to explain these things in such a way that people understand the decision they make. Uh, we uh, scientists do not necessarily have the the mission of making policies but they certainly have the responsibility to explaining the science behind everything that's happening in this in 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 this uh in this context so um let's let's be educated and let's make sure that we spread the word so in summary for this uh, last screencast for for this course um earth receives a lot of energy from the sun and uh, we can uh, try to explain the radiation, how the radiation is actually uh, reaches the Earth and uh, either directly from the sun after passing through the atmosphere or indirectly back from the atmosphere after hitting the Earth. And this is what's happening with the global warming as carbon uh, dioxide in the atmosphere and water can absorb some of the infrared uh, photons that come from the Earth as treated as a black body uh, radiator and are re-radiated re back to the Earth and therefore increasing the temperature. Um, I think that, uh, I, I hope that you were able to get all the tools you need to, under to understand these effects and uh, to study them further if you uh, feel uh, that they are of interest to you. Thank you very much and take care.